Okay, this video is what causes back pain and what can you do to prevent it. Um, this is one of the books I've written. I've written two books about the spine. This one is called Ischemic Spine, the most common cause of back pain. Okay, here's a picture of the lumbar spine. This is a sagittal. This means to look at the spine from the side. Um, so lumbar spine has five vertebrae. So you start at the bottom, L5, L4, L3. Beneath that is the sacrum, and these are labeled S1, 2, and 3. Okay, the abdominal aorta runs right in front of the spine. It gives off a posterior directed artery called the lumbar artery, runs at the mid height of the vertebral body, and it has a small branch going to the upper part of the vertebral body called the upper end plate, and the lower part of the vertebral body called the lower end plate. The disc does not have any blood vessels, but the disc is alive. It runs on anaerobic glycolysis. It needs the glucose delivered by the arteries. Once the arterial um, glucose gets to the end plate, it then travels by diffusion into the disc. The disc also expels its waste products, and those are removed by the, you know, the capillaries and the veins of the end plate here, the inferior end plate and upper end plate and lower end plate is what I usually call them. Okay. But that's a key point. The disc is alive. All right, here's a lumbar spine MRI. Um, if you went to a zoology class, you would learn that there's, you know, two giant kingdoms of life. There's like the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. Obviously, there's more to it than that. You could get into the fungi and all that stuff. But what I'm basically saying is an MRI, what animal kingdom, plant kingdom is to, uh, to zoology, to life on earth study, is what T1 and T2 is to MRI. And the key thing to know is on T1 sequence, the fluid is dark. This is cerebral spinal fluid right here outlining the spinal cord. On T2, fluid is bright. This is all the fluid, cerebral spinal fluid. Here is the spinal cord. Okay, the bottom of the spinal cord is called the conus. All right, we can count the vertebrae again, S1, L5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So the vertebral body heights are intact. T1 sequence is good for looking at the bone marrow, making sure there's no metastatic disease, there's no infection. There hardly ever is. Okay, and then you can look at the disc base heights. Normally, the disc will get a little bit bigger all the way down. The L5-S1 disc is variable in its height. Okay, but this is the normal anatomy of the lumbar spine on a sagittal T T1 MRI. I've seen tens of thousands of these. Okay, here is the appearance on a T2 MRI. By the way, I'm the one who teaches the other fellowship-trained doctors about this stuff, okay? Um, so then I also have my entire theory, the Peter Rogers theory of degenerative disc disease. Okay, we'll get into that at the end of this talk. All right, so anyways, you want to look where the conus is. If you've got to do a lumbar puncture, you want to make sure you're puncturing below that. You know, L2-3 is usually a good level to go. Again, this is a normal appearance of a T2 lumbar spine MRI. And I'll show you what abnormal looks like here in a moment. Just wanted to introduce you to what normal looks like. And one of the key points of this talk is that just like Everybody knows heart disease means atherosclerosis in the arteries of the heart, the coronaries, and a lack of blood supply to the heart muscle, um, causing it to you know die rapidly. That would be an acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack, versus to die gradually, like with congestive heart failure, a lot of times with atrial fibrillation as well. Um, same thing with the brain. You can have a sudden onset big stroke in the brain, or you could have gradual progressive apoptosis and silent strokes destroying the brain. Um, you got big vessels, macroscopic, large vessels, and you also got little vessels. And there's such a thing in the heart as uh, microvascular angina. So, but the point I'm making here is everything in the human body with aging, especially in a Western society, really in a Western society, tends to be damaged by atherosclerosis, plugging up arteries. That's what causes the main cause of impotence. It's the main cause of dementia. Um, it's main, a major cause of blindness, of hearing loss, but it's also the spine. For some reason, people don't think of blood supply to the spine, but it's actually one of the most important things in causing back pain. All right, so, you know, the sad diet, which is in the meat and the carnivore, paleo, keto stuff, it's all just plugs up arteries. Okay, um, when patients have back pains, you know, they get sent typically for a spine MRI. Spine MRI is better than CAT scan. A CAT scan of the spine is useful it's good in the acute setting. It's better for showing fractures, like with a trauma patient. But other than that, for most things, the lumbar spine MRI shows the anatomy much better. Um, the other thing, too, I'm going to make the point here is lots and lots of fat people, some skinny people, too, but lots of fat people I see, and they all think, oh, I got back pain. If only I could get spine surgery, that would solve all my problems. And one of the things I would tell you is, the patients who are involved in their own care trying to make things best, they have the best outcomes. 
So there's a lot a person can do to minimize their back pain and to prevent future spine problems by you know, optimizing their diet, their sleep, and all this. And we'll talk about why that is. A smart move is to learn about your problem and what you can do to minimize it or you know, recover from it. Okay, a little bit more information on the disc. Um, you know, by the way, the upper and lower end plates of the vertebral body have poor blood supply to begin with. The disc, again, has no blood vessels. It gets its glucose and excretes its waste products through diffusion uh, with regard to the end plates. Um, it runs on anaerobic glycolysis, the disc does. Um, it has what are called hydrated glycosaminoglycan, sort of protein carbohydrate structures that absorb water, and they are like shock absorbers for the spine. The disc, you know, helps with evenly distributing the weight when a person is moving. Um, it is dependent on blood supply from that abdominal aorta. People routinely get a lot of atherosclerosis in their abdominal aorta, especially along the posterior wall, which will narrow. The medical word for narrowing is stenosis. Stenosis or occlude the lumbar arteries going to the spine. Then you get less blood supply to the vertebra, you get less blood supply to the disc, and the disc will start to fail. Um, so you can also get injury to the end plate from infections, okay, but we're not going to talk too much about infections today. They're, they're rare. All right, disc ischemia. I'll show you a picture here in a moment, but just so you've heard the word, the outer part of the disc is like a steel belted radial tire. It's called the annulus fibrosis. And then the center is like a center of a jelly donut. That's called the nucleus pulposus. Um, when the disc loses height, which is very, 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 very common, uh, that's typically called degenerative disc disease. Um, when it bulges posteriorly, it can bulge diffusely, be diffuse disc bulge, or it can bulge focally and be what's called a hernia. Um, the disc is innervated. It has a nerve going to it, like the sinovertebral nerve, and that can cause pain. Uh, okay. Now, here's a little more anatomy of the spine. This would be uh, like an L5-S1 disc that's narrowed in height due to degeneration. There can be some congenital narrowing of the disc as well. There can be transitional forms of the lumbosacral junction. Okay, but in general, the point is shown this disc would be, imagine it had been taller, now it has lost height. This would be degenerative disc disease, typically. Okay, um, here is abnormal signal. This would be in the posterior part of the disc, and we will typically call these an annular fissure. They used to be called, you know, at, meaning a, a little tear in the annulus fibrosis. We tend to not call them tears anymore, because tear has implications of trauma. Like, uh, when a person hears the word tear, they think that, you know, a sudden event happened and the thing got torn, whereas a lot of times it appears to gradually degenerate. So the appropriate medical word nowadays in uh, 2024 is annular fissure. Okay, um, this little annular fissure is when you have a tear in the annulus fibrosis, again like a steel belted radial tire around the outer part of the disc is the annulus fibrosis. The nucleus pulposus, a center like a jelly donut, can leak some of its contents through the torn layers of the annulus fibrosis, the fissured layers, and when it happens focally and bulges posteriorly, that would be a disc protrusion at the height of the, of the disc. Um, and just having an annular fissure can be painful in and of itself. Um, if the disc herniation is large and pushes on a nerve, for example, that can be more painful. Okay, a little bit of brief terminology. We've got to go through this first before we get into more interesting stuff. When the disc just focally bulges posteriorly, that's called a protrusion. Protrusion. When the disc bulges posteriorly and then goes up and down above the height of the vertebral body, like here's the lower and upper extents of the disc space, when it goes below that or above that, that's called an extrusion. And to some extent, these are like code words. And they're code words in a sense to say, is this patient more likely or less likely to need surgery? In general, protrusions are usually left alone. There's exceptions to that, but in general, they tend to be left alone. Whereas extrusions, in general... While most of them don't need to go to the operating room, they're much more likely to be recommended for surgery because it's a bigger disc herniation. These are both what would typically in the past be called a disc herniation. So this would typically be a small disc herniation and an extrusion would imply typically a bigger disc extrusion. It's also possible focally you can get a disc that goes way far posteriorly and stays at the height of the disc and that would be a large disc protrusion. It's also possible that the extrusion stays up tight against the posterior wall of the vertebral body and that would be called a small extrusion. But in general, protrusion means bigger disc herniation. I'm sorry, protrusion means small disc herniation, and extrusion means big disc herniation. 
Okay, the disc can herniate into the vertebral body itself. If there's a soft end plate from osteoporosis, for example, or sometimes in other cases, you know, it can just happen. Okay, and when the disc herniates into the vertebral body, that has a specific name called a Schmorl's node. Those are thought to be painful initially, but to often then become asymptomatic. Okay. I actually think I had one of those one time when I was squatting real heavy weights. When I was a young guy, I had sudden back pain, and then I took off about three months, and it all went away. And I think that's what happened. I never got imaged. I figured I'm not going to go to surgery. Why get an image? Okay, anyways, there's fat in the spinal canal. This is the anterior epidural space. This is the posterior uh, epidural space. The, the lining, the sac in which the cerebral spinal fluid sits is called the dura. So epidural means above the dura, outside the dura, okay? So this is epidural fat. And the reason I'm showing you a picture where the fat is located in the spinal canal is some people, some fat people, accumulate a lot of fat in the epidural space. And by the way, I've had some people say, oh, I shouldn't use the word fat, that I'm fat shaming people. And you know what my attitude is? Look, if we want to have an intelligent conversation, we need to be precise about our terms. And fat is fat, okay? So tell it like it is. You know, all these same people in my experience who saying, oh, you should never fat shame and all this stuff. You know what? When you don't talk about the truth about what you're talking about, the same people who say you should never fat shame a patient, like at all these big universities, they put these patients on keto diets, Mediterranean diets, and the patients get worse. And then they send them for bariatric surgery, or they put them on that, those, uh, you know, Gila Monster, Venom type weight loss drugs. It's a big joke, okay? Conventional medicine stinks at uh, nutrition and, and stuff. So I don't take them seriously with regard to obesity, nutrition, and all that. They're a big joke. All of them, the Ivy Leagues, etc. I've never seen a single university in my life that was good for nutrition. And probably the best one I've ever seen would be Loma Linda. But even the guys over at Loma, Loma Linda, from what I've seen, are full of nonsense, okay? They recommend like high fat vegan, is what I've seen coming out of there, which is a joke, okay? And the way you can sort of handle the poser BS artist is that, you know, low-fat vegan is the only thing that's reversed coronary artery disease, right? Okay? The work of Dr. Uh, Ornish, Dr. Esselstyn, and it's been shown in animal studies too. You put them on a low-fat diet and their atherosclerosis reverses like the work of Armstrong. Okay, I've talked about that before in my atherosclerosis lectures. Okay, so here is now, a again, a sagittal lumbar spine. This is a T2 sequence. You know it's T2 because you can see the, the bright fluid, the high signal intensity fluid. So... Um, the brighter the signal that you call it, the higher the intensity of the signal. Because MRI is, uh, image is obtained with a magnet, and signal intensity is described as high or low. High signal intensity means bright. Low signal intensity means dark. All right, so what you can see here is these are normal-looking discs. All right? And then here is the L45 disc, and you notice that it has lower signal than the adjacent disc. So this would be dried out a little bit. The typical medical word, word used in a dictation of an MRI report would be desiccated disc. So they might say L45 desiccated disc. And also you have a focal bulge of the disc posteriorly. If it's all along the posterior surface, there might be diffuse disc bulge of L4-5. But you, if it was focal, you would say L4-5 central disc protrusion. And I know it's a, I know it's central because I'm at the center of the cord level, okay? And the spine's relatively straight. I can see all the vertebral bodies on the same image. Now, if you look at L5-S1, you can see that there's probably some loss of height here. It might be congenital, but it's probably a loss of height because it's a little wider, taller in the front, for example. You see that the posterior part of the vertebral body is sticking out posterior to the adjacent vertebra, the S1 vertebra. Um, so the, the way most people would describe this, the word for when one VB sticks out posteriorly relative to another is retrolisthesis. Um, because it's mild, this would be grade one retrolisthesis. So a typical MRI report of this would call this L5-S1 mild comma grade one retrolisthesis. All right, actually how I would describe this is because the anterior part of L5 is lined up with the anterior part of S1, I actually think this is something called pseudolisthesis, meaning that it's always going to stick out a little bit in front or back because it's longer, anterior posterior. That's just a normal variant, okay? Um, the signal is a little bit abnormal here, a little bit of increased uh, signal in this M plate, upper M plate, I'm sorry, the inferior M plate L5, superior M plate S1, and there's name for that. It's, it's, there, we're not going to get into all of them, but that would that would be mild end plate signal. So the way I would describe this probably is L5-S1, moderate disc space narrowing with associated mild end plate signal. 
suggestive of degenerative disc disease. And I would just let it go like that. I see this all day long, every day, tons of patients. That's what degenerative disc disease typically looks like. Okay, I'm briefly going to mention you something called DISH. DISH is the, the uh, acronym for diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. This is super common. And you see bridging osteophytes. Um, so, you know, DISH, people used to think DISH is not the common. They don't know what they're talking about. I'll see this on most patients all day long, every day. It's most common in the thoracic spine. It's super common in the cervical spine as well. And I also see it routinely in the lumbar spine. Every single day I see this a bunch of times. Um, it's part of my macros for certain things when I have to type my dictations. Usually, I, you know, I have voice recognition software. But anyway, what happens is the disc fails. And when the disc fails, it becomes dried out, desiccated. It can no longer evenly distribute the weight. Now, the uh, vertebra has to bear more of the weight. And to facilitate its ability to bear more weight, it'll grow these osteophytes. And the osteophyte from this vertebra, and that means bone spurs, will grow towards the osteophyte from the adjacent vertebra, and then eventually they'll fuse. And what I really think is happening here is that the disc is alive, and there are appropriate receptors. That means they there are sensory nerves that sense when there's abnormal motion in the spine. The spinal vertebra have a very important job in the disc. Their job is to protect the spinal cord, the central nervous system. Okay, so when there's abnormal motion, they get concerned and they want to fix that problem. So what they're doing in a sense is when the disc fails, they start having instability and abnormal motion at the level of the failed disc. So in order to fix that problem, it's as if they did surgery on themselves. They fuse that level by growing out bone spurs. They, number one, make their weight-bearing surface bigger to better bear the weight. Number two, the bone spurs grow towards each other and they fuse. And then you will no longer have abnormal motion there. The abnormal motion puts the risk of progression of that abnormal motion to the point where the spinal cord and nerves might be injured. So this is really like the only thing the spine can do. It can grow bone to fuse segments with abnormal motion. That's super important. You have to know that. Okay, and I can also tell you there were some papers like going back to the 1980s talking about abdominal aorta atherosclerosis can lead to degenerative disc disease. But I'm the one that figured out it leads to everything, okay? It's what causes DISH. It's what causes, you'll also get growth of bone along the posterior surface here. There's something called the posterior longitudinal ligament, and that'll become ossified. So that's called OPLL, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. I'll show you more of that in a moment. But it's all the same, and it starts all the way down here at the sacrum, and it goes all the way up to the skull. I see this all day, every day. And the reason why I claim to be the one who figured it out, I can tell you, if you go back to all the textbooks, like from the 1990s, for example, they're all going to say, well, I'll show you a picture of OPL. It'll make more sense when I get to the actual picture of OPL. Okay, so here's an example of it. Here's an abdominal aorta. I use orange here to show you the calcifications, and the calcifications... Uh, indicate atherosclerosis, which is going to indicate uh, atherosclerosis getting into the lumbar arteries, causing narrowing, stenosis, and occlusions of these lumbar arteries. When you get an occlusion of these lumbar arteries, then you don't get enough blood supply to the end plate, so you don't get enough glucose to the, uh, to the disc, and you can't remove the waste products of the disc effectively, so the disc will fail. As the disc fails, you'll lose disc space height, and then you'll get abnormal motion at this segment. So in order to protect itself from the abnormal motion, which might progress and go on to damage the spinal cord, the disc starts laying down bone. Most commonly, it forms a bone spur anteriorly uh, from both of the adjacent vertebrae across the abnormal disc. These then fuse. Okay, and then you will also quite often form uh, bone along the posterior surface of the disc, and there's a ligament right here called the posterior longitudinal ligament. It's posterior because it's posterior to the vertebra, and that will uh, become ossified, and that's called OPLL, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. And I see this all the time, most commonly in the cervical spine, but I see it in the lumbar spine and the thoracic spine as well. In addition, you'll lay down calcification in the failed disc, and you'll start to fuse these vertebrae across the vertebral bodies. So fusion of the vertebral bodies is called interbody fusion. Again, I see this multiple times all day long every day. And I'm the one who figured out all of this stuff. It's all the same thing. It's all an attempt of the disc to fuse. It's all an attempt of the spine to fuse itself across abnormal disc levels to protect itself from worsening instability that might injure the cord and the nerves. Okay, So it's all degenerative disc disease and it's all primarily ischemic. So what should you do if you want to avoid this stuff? And this is the most common reason people have back pain and their spines end up being a big disaster. 
is avoid things that cause atherosclerosis. Diabetes and hypertension and, and obesity are the main causes of atherosclerosis. So you want to avoid those things. How do you avoid them? Low-fat, low-sodium, vegan diet, okay? And that's why a low-fat, low-sodium, vegan diet fixes numerous problems, okay? It's kind of like the quote in the Bible of St. Peter. It says, love cures a multitude of ills, okay? Basically, you know, the reason why parents do a good job taking care of kids is because they love that kid and they do whatever they can to help that kid. And what I'm trying to say is if you want to have a good spine, give it good blood flow. You know, that's the main thing you could do to prevent spine problems. Yeah, there's more to it than that, but that's the main thing. Okay, so DISH, super common, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. And they found that they had to do some construction products in Europe, and they had to dig up a bunch of graveyards. And so the graveyards where they had buried all these aristocrats who were eating lots of meat, um, you know, they had more money, and they were having a lot of beer, you know, they're fat with lots of dish, okay? Then you dig up the graveyards of the peasants, you know, they're eating turnips, they're skinny, you know, they had hardly any dish, okay? Dish just goes with, like I said, OPLL and interbody fusion, and it goes with diabetes, and it goes with hypertension, okay? Um, you'll find those articles pretty easy if you look them up on the internet, and there was even some famous astronomer, I think Tycho Brahe, who uh, had dish or something, and there's articles about him as well, you know, from, he's like from around the 1500s or something, he's sort of like the the days of Johannes Kepler and all that stuff. Um, dish will tend to lead to autofusion of the entire spine eventually from the sacrum up to the skull. And the patient will you know, be, have a lot of pain and a lot of stiffness in their spine. And they walk kind of hunched over. Because they stop exercising much, the muscles of the spine become very weak. These are the kind of guys often in a walker or a motorized scooter. And they're very much at risk for severe fractures if they fall down. Those are called chalk stick fractures. They can cause paraplegia, quadriplegia. Um, I've seen a lot of those. I see one of those every couple of months typically. Okay, uh, what can you do to treat the spine? Well, you could rest. You can give them pain medicines, analgesics. You could give them steroid medicines in the acute phase. You can do surgery to decompress it. Uh, I have another uh, list of treatment pages. Of course, you can inject corticosteroids into the epidural space. You can inject them into the foramen, etc. You can inject local anesthetic. There are a lot of things the pain management doctors can do. You know, like PMR, anesthesiology docs are the most common ones to do that. Some neuroradiologists do those as well. I actually used to do that. I used to run a pain management spine clinic. And so I did tons and tons of epidural steroids, selective nerve root blocks, disc, um, discograms, all this stuff, myelograms, lumbar punctures, nonstop. Uh, but I actually find the brain a lot more interesting than the spine. But the spine is still important to know about, so that's what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, what can a surgeon do? A surgeon can decompress a segment. Let's say you have a big disc extrusion and it's pushing on the nerves or this cord, spinal cord. You can decompress it. You can open up the posterior uh, part of the spine called the lamina and do a laminectomy. Okay. If you've got a lot of abnormal motion, the surgeon can fuse it. You know, Do some type of like a two-level posterior instrumented fusion with pedicle screws. That would be a very common thing to do. They can fuse the across the disc space, an interbody fusion. All right. They can widen the foramen by increasing the height of the disc, um, like an anterior cervical discectomy infusion to open up the height of the foramen and give the nerve more room to exit the spinal canal through, okay? But what I'm also going to say, optimizing blood flow to the spine is one of the best things you could do for the spine, okay? Um, sometimes it can be psychogenic. Most pain is not psychogenic, but sometimes pain can be psychogenic. I remember when I was a resident, we had to get a chest x-ray. It was like required of us, okay? So I went and got a chest x-ray and I had a little bit of scoliosis in my thoracic spine. And now it's normal to have a little bit of scoliosis in the thoracic spine, but I was kind of freaked out about it because I thought of myself as the perfect physical specimen of health. And I'm like, oh my God, I've got a little scoliosis. So then I opened up some book and the stupid book said, well, scoliosis of the spine can be caused by cancer. I'm like, oh my God, I could have cancer, okay? So I went and got like a CAT scan on my spine and I showed it to the neuroradiology attending and they started laughing at me because I was a totally healthy young guy. But my, I, then I had back pain for like a month or two after that. And uh, afterwards though, a pretty experienced doctor said to me, look, everybody's got a little bit of scoliosis of the thoracic spine and um, you know, it's not a big deal. It's just normal. Okay. It's normal in a young guy your age. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. And once I understood it was normal, all my back pain went away. So I was sort of obsessing about it for a little while. And then my family teased me a little bit. They go, oh, you got scoliosis in your spine. That's why you're not as tall as your brothers. And I'm like, you know what? Somebody, and they say, because you lifted weights too much when you were young. Because I, I started lifting weights a lot when I was 
young wrestler in junior high. Okay, so not that that was smart. But I didn't do any squats or deadlifts or any of that. Anyways, getting back to this. What are other ways to treat the spine? Walking is important because walking gets the muscles moving and then it uh, maintains the strength of those muscles. It gets more nitric oxide to be released to vasodilate um, in the end plates of the spine. And so that facilitates getting more nutrients to the spine and removing the waste products from the disc. You don't want to lay in bed too much or then you tend to get sicker. You can you know physical therapy might help. Uh, chiropractor could potentially help, but I, I wouldn't go to a chiropractor for the neck because uh, I'd be worried about that causing a, a vertebral artery dissection. But some people have claimed they've got benefit from them and the thoracic and the lumbar spines. Um, like I said, I wouldn't let them touch the neck. That's because I've seen strokes from that. It's rare. It's real rare, but I've seen it. Okay, acupuncture. I used to do all this, this acupuncture stuff. Um, TENS units is like the gating theory of pain, meaning that if you overstimulate the touch receptors with this mild electrical current, that it'll distract the person away from the smaller, you know, narrow diameter pain fibers, and that can be relief of some pain. So you can get one of those little battery pack and put that on your back. Uh, nerve blocks and epidural steroids, like I said, there's a lot of uh, doctors who do these. PMR doctors and anesthesiologists are the main ones who do those. Some neuroradiologists do them. Um, open surgical procedures, we talked about that. You can decompress or fuse. Um, optimize nutrition exercise. Lead. Most people don't do this. This could actually make a giant difference because a lot of times the nerve is ischemic when it's compressed, meaning it has lack of oxygen delivery. And you improve blood flow to it, you improve its oxygen, the nerve's got a much better chance to heal. Okay, uh, what else can improve blood flow? I just gave a whole lecture on how to improve blood flow. So some obvious things, plants got potassium, magnesium, and nitrates. All those things are vasodilators. They improve blood flow. Avoid sodium. It's an inhibitor of endothelial nitric oxide, so it's a vasoconstrictor. Avoid high dietary fat, especially sat fat and omega-6s. They tend to especially sludge the blood and make it thick. Okay, um, you know, no, alcohol, no tobacco, no alcohol. All that stuff is for chumps. You really shouldn't be drinking. If you're a serious person about achievement, um, I see alcohol ruin a lot of people's lives. Okay, walk a lot, get your sunshine, maintain your strength, um, manage your stress, your relationships, avoid caffeine. Caffeine is also a vasoconstrictor. And also just having a sense of purpose in your life, you know, like you wake up in the morning, like I have to give another lecture this week, so I have a purpose when I wake up in the morning. I know that I have to do this spine lecture because I'm going to have to repeat this spine lecture uh, to some doctors that I'm teaching. Okay, so that motivates me to do this, and I'm also... You know, I got a bunch of projects that I'm working on. So that always motivates me to get out of bed in the morning with energy to do some things, okay? For a lot of people, religion helps them. Religious people are way healthier than other people. And that, that doesn't get talked about much. But if you start reading about it, you'd be amazed how much healthier they are. And also for any person, just doing something that helps other people, it makes you happier. And I think it's because we get reward neurotransmitters released when we help other people. And that's a big part of why that's like one of the things that makes a person happier than anything. I think perhaps you get reward neurotransmitters because if you help other people, they're more likely to want you around so you survive longer and things that increase survival tend to be rewarded. So I think it all feeds back in a positive, good way. So here's a picture of Beethoven, the great uh, classical music composer. I show it because he loved to go for walks and he would give him ideas for his composing. And lots of people get better ideas. Lots of geniuses have all written about when they walk, it helps them to think. And I think the reason is we talked about it. What's the purpose of a brain? to walk through a path in a jungle, a forest, or a prairie, and to survive. So our brain is on hyper alert when we're walking. You have to be because you have to navigate the path that you're on. You have to avoid obstacles. You have to have a destination. You have to know how to find your way back. So it activates your brain. So Nietzsche, Beethoven, Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, uh, Aristotle, and tons of other geniuses have all written about how they're so, they so much like to walk as it activates the brain and makes them smart. That was called the peripatetic method of teaching. Aristotle would walk around and talk to his students. Um, and that's a great way to teach. It's a very pleasant thing to walk around and have a conversation with a person. Okay, so here's something that I'll do at my house sometimes. After I come home from work, I sometimes walk around in circles you know, for a half hour or an hour. This is my old house before I put the basketball court in here. You could see what our living room looked like before I put a basketball court in there. It was like a piece of crap, okay? Nobody cared about it. You know, this is like a dog bed. You know, we have a dog in there. The whole place was a mess and we were using it for storage. So I put a basketball court in there. My wife went crazy, but my kids loved it. You know, indoor basketball. I mean, I thought that was a cool house with indoor basketball. Anyways, I would walk around in circles in the house and read. And I also have often had the experience that, so I can get a little more exercise after a full day of working, 
I also noticed that a lot of times if I read a book and I'm starting to pay, space out where you read a paragraph, you can't remember what the paragraph was just about. I stand up and I walk and all of a sudden I can, again, engage in the paragraph and understand everything very well. And it's a pleasant thing to do, walk around and read a book. Uh, so that's just a quick way to get some exercise. And, you know, you keep moving all these blue zone places. They all move a lot. They don't necessarily specifically exercise. Okay, so here's a whole bunch of references if you want about the things I talked about. Um, now I'm going to get into some more stuff and a little bit more esoteric rare stuff, but it's still useful. You've seen me show this slide before. Basically, you want to get your act together. The sooner the better. Definitely by middle age. You know, the sooner you get it together, the better off you will be. The typical chump eats, you know, mead, oil, and all this stuff. They get go to the medical system, drug after drug, then surgery, chop, 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 bye bye money, dead prematurely. Smart move is you got to get your act together. And I just list here, you know, the diet, avoiding toxins. The vegan community doesn't tend to know this too well. I talk about it a lot because that's a big part of being healthy. And then all the psychological stuff we talked about, and you know, the exercise habit, and basically like Super Mario Brothers, any video game. In order to be healthy, you do all the things that give you energy points and you avoid all the things that take away your energy points. And that's how you stay healthy. That's what it's like. Okay, just a couple things real quick here. Chris Knob, the ophthalmologist who studied all the epidemiology of nutrition and health, came to the conclusion that the number one thing making people sick is the increased intake of vegetable oils, and that had a tight correlation with obesity and diabetes, whereas sugar and saturated fat did not okay but of course he's sort of a pro meat guy so everybody's got a bias so he's trying to downplay the effect of saturated fats because that would make meat look bad all right but nevertheless this is pretty interesting and he found the same pattern in all the countries eating westernized diets we've talked before about the bliss point you know salt sugar and fat plus it's also this glutamate stuff makes people addicted to foods also, the good mouthfeel and texture. Look at food companies research that to get you addicted. And that's why people just, it's hard for them to get, break away from eating the junk food. They just process any food that has a lot of glutamate in it. You know, typically gluten does. That's why it's called gluten. Casein, the milk protein, soy, whey. These all have very high percentages of amino acids of the glutamate type. Because normally there's 20 amino acids. So theoretically, there should only be, you know, one-fifth, 5% of a protein, if everything was equally distributed, would be glutamate. So in these proteins that concentrate a lot of glutamate, you just process it in whatever the way, pasteurization, enzyme lysis, hydrolysis, whatever, it will break apart these glutamate receptors. Our ancestors worried about starving. So for them to find a good protein source, that might enable them to survive. So you get a lot of release of reward transmitters when you taste this in your mouth. We even have taste receptors through more distal parts of our intestinal tract for glutamate, because it's a sign of successfully finding a protein source. And that's why it makes stuff taste good. So this is called free glutamate because it's been freed up by processing, meaning that the peptide bonds between the individual amino acids. A protein is like a string of pearls, with each pearl being an amino acid um, to make the protein. So when you break these bonds, the peptide bonds, you free up the glutamate to be separate individual amino acids. And that's what activates the umami taste receptors for glutamate. Okay, briefly on cholesterol. Cholesterol has a four-ring structure. The rings are called A, B, C, and D. It's got an alcohol group over here, all, so that's why you get the OL for all. That means alcohol group. Um, choline because it's used to make bile. Choline means bile. Stair because it's a steroid, so that's why it's called choline sterol, all right? And then here is estrogen, which is a steroid hormone. So they're called steroid hormones because they got four rings, all right? Estra, you know, it's the estrogen, the female hormone. Di means two, so there's a alcohol group here, one and two, all right? So that's called diol. So it's the estra female hormone with two alcohol groups on it. The unique thing about estrogen, though, is this ring here, the A ring, has three double bonds. Three double bonds makes it also called a benzene ring, and it can also be called an aromatic ring. They tend to smell well. Okay, anyways, this hydroxyl group on here is also called an alcohol group. And what I'm trying to say is this alcohol group here makes it antimicrobial, antifungal. And that's why it's in everything. They put this in all the personal care products. They put it in all kinds of things because it prevents mold from growing. And nobody wants mold growing on their stuff. And no company wants that growing on their product or it'll get returned to the, uh, to the company. Okay, the aromatic ring, these three double bonds can actually move around. And the electrons in these shared by these carbons can move around they're called pi electrons and the bottom line is this thing will sit on the shelf for you know four or five years and it won't change so this is in everything and it's never going to go away and they're always going to make some version of that you know it's a great preservative worth billions of dollars 
And they use these estrogenic chemicals for tons of things. So the classic example is bisphenol A. Bis means two, two of something that are on different locations, not touching each other. So here's one phenol group. You know, the, the benzene ring and the hydroxyl group together are called a phenol. So it's bis meaning two phenol. So there's a phenol group here, phenol group here. And then there's just some intervening chemical group in the middle. And when people said, oh, bisphenol A is bad, it's neurotoxic to the brain, it's a mitochondrial inhibitor, it's estrogenic, okay, it's carcinogenic, get it out of our food, don't use it in baby bottles. The companies go, okay, fine, yeah, sure, we'll make you happy. So they just do something like BPS. So they just put the group in the center as a sulfate. It's still going to activate estrogen and be toxic for similar reasons, okay? A little bit about what happens for detoxification. Why am I showing you the stuff about estrogen and talking about the spine? The reason is estrogen is a fat storage hormone. So when a person has high estrogen levels, they're making themselves fatter, and that predisposes them to have more spine problems, more obesity, more hypertension, more diabetes. Okay, so what happens is the body excretes its extra estrogen through the liver. There's two phases of detox. First of all, you hydroxylate it, you know, adding a hydroxyl group, same thing as an alcohol group, OH. And then you conjugate it, and that'll typically be something called glucuronidation. So the glucuronic acid, it's, to think of it as being like a glucose with a carboxylic acid added to it. They'll add that to the E for estrogen. They'll excrete that into the bile, so that's excreted from the liver. Then it goes into the intestinal tract. However, here's what happens. Normally, you would just defecate it out. You would poop it out of your body, and that's how your body lowers its estrogen levels. However, when you don't eat enough fiber or you eat a meat processed food diet where there's, you know, meat has zero fiber, processed food has very little fiber, um, then you get a different type of bacteria. This what I would call the bad bacteria. The bad bacteria, they have more of an enzyme called glucuronidase. And so what this does is it removes this glucuronic acid conjugation. Sometimes that's called unconjugates the estrogen. When that happens, the free estrogen is absorbed into the blood. And so it raises our bodily estrogen levels, okay? So this is another reason why, you know, meat eaters, processed food eaters, they have higher estrogen levels, meaning that they tend to be, which also leads to more obesity, more diabetes, more hypertension, more breast cancer, more prostate cancer. So that's what that's all about. And I know people who, you know, will tell me every single woman in their family had to get a hysterectomy before the age of 35 because of fibroids typically. And so that's because they eat a lot of meat and processed food and they also, they don't filter their water, okay? There's a lot of estrogenic chemicals in the drinking water unless you have a carbon filter. Carbon filter will remove them. Okay, so that's the reason why people fat. Now here I'm just going to show you a little bit about the gut. The gut has a single layer of cells that line it. These are called the enterocytes because the gut's also called the enteric tract. Normally when we eat fiber, the fiber feeds the good gut bacteria. They make short chain fatty acids, most importantly butyrate. The butyrate is used by the gut lining cells to make TJs, tight junctions, and that prevents us from having leaky gut. Leaky gut's also called increased intestinal permeability. If you were to have leaky gut, see these tight junctions are broken apart because the person is just eating meat and processed foods. They don't have any fiber here, not enough. And then you'll get bacterial endotoxins like LPS getting across the, the gut lining cells. You'll get big chunks of protein coming across that can cause autoimmune disease due to you know, autoantibody molecular mimicry cross-reactivity. I've talked about that a bunch before in all my lectures. Uh, so the bottom line is you don't want leaky gut. All of these things here can cause leaky gut and all of this can lead to autoimmune disease, can lead to gut inflammation, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. So you want to avoid that because indirectly this stuff can contribute to spine inflammation, spine ischemia. It makes the blood more prone to clotting. It makes the blood prothrombotic which can decrease the blood supply to the disc. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is when the person improves their overall health by avoiding all this stuff, they, their spine condition might improve. Can't guarantee it will, but it might. And this is just the other thing about fiber. Lack of dietary fiber causes abdominal pressure syndrome. I actually would call this the Western abdomen. When I look at a CAT scan of the abdomen, I see all this stuff pretty routinely, okay? Especially diverticulosis, nonstop do I see that, and hiatal hernias. That stuff is so common. I, you know, I don't even barely notice it. I almost expect it to be there. Okay, uh, when you got leaky gut, you can get these bacterial endotoxins getting through. Like I said, LPS from gram-negative bacteria, lipopolysaccharide, LTA from gram-positive bacteria. Uh, it's called lipotychoic acid, and they predispose the blood to be more prone to clotting. And, you know, atherosclerosis is just a blood clot. So you're more prone to plugging up arteries with these, with these clots and these um, endo postprandial endotoxemia clots. Postprandial means after eating. Um, and they're called amyloidogenic because they change the shape of fibrinogen, the blood clotting protein, and they're more difficult to dissolve, to lyse. Um, they can cause people a significant amount of morbidity. 
Okay, and also you get autoimmune diseases from leaky gut. Now, this multiple sclerosis in the in the in the spine is relatively rare. It's most commonly in the cervical spine, and then the next thing is you know in the thoracic spine. So it's relatively uncommon, but the inflammation associated with leaky gut is relatively common. I just show you this because it's you know one more thing on the path to problems. And basically, the great benefit of all this diet and health stuff I'm telling you is you don't just improve spine pain; you improve almost every single, almost all the common health problems in the body. To some extent. Okay, glyphosate, the stuff they spray on the non-organic uh, soy and some other uh, non-organic foods, it's a bit of a Trojan horse. I mean, it comes in looking like one thing, and inside your body it turns into something else. Um, so, you know, here's glycine. It's amino acid, the smallest amino acid. It only has a hydrogen as its side group, as its R group. And glyphosate, I sometimes call it glycine phosphate. You know, really officially it should be glyphosate. Okay, fine. But the reason why I call it glycine phosphate is that's easier to remember. So think of it as being like a glycine with an added phosphate on there. There's a little more to it than that. But if you think of it that way, you'll be able to understand what it does. And that's the important thing. The lady who's written the most about it is this lady, Stephanie Seneff. Her, her book, Toxic Legacy, is real good. It's kind of a complicated book. She has a bunch of lectures where she shows picture slides. So if you really want to get a sense of her work, I'd recommend you watch her videos. Um, Okay, so an enzyme is like a catalyst, and what that does is when you have a chemical reaction, you start out with a substrate, you end up with a product. But the reason why the reaction doesn't happen spontaneously is because you have a transition phase where it takes a lot of energy to go through that transition phase. What an enzyme does is it lowers the energy required to undergo the transition phase. So it'll increase the frequency at which the reaction occurs. Okay, so that's what an enzyme does. I'm talking about this because I'm going to show you what distorts an enzyme here in just a moment. Okay, so here's what distorts the enzyme. Uh, well, here's actually how an enzyme works real quick. This is called the key in the lock model of enzyme function whereby the substrates fit together, the enzyme then catalyzes the reaction, you make new products. It's also been described as an induced fit whereby you get a shape change. Um, and that's like the, the hand in a glove approach. I also had another slide. I, I think I forgot. I forgot it. It's one of my, um, where there's magnetic properties, like the charge in the center of the active site, as well as along the path to the active site, uh, facilitates the substrates going into it. So anyways, here would be an enzyme where you've got the substrates in there, but they're not orientated correctly to each other, so nothing happens. Uh, for an enzyme to work, it has to orientate the substrates correctly. So like this fits into this, and <clears throat> that will get the enzyme, the reaction to successfully occur. Um, and the active site, like I said, can have a charge in it. Like let's say it'll have a negative charge in it. That'll attract a positively charged substrate. I'm showing you all this because I'm going to show you in a moment how that gets messed up. So what uh, the work of Dr. Seneff is is that this glyphosate, glycine phosphate, she believes is replacing glycine in proteins, including at... Um, enzyme active sites and causing them to dysfunction. So let's say this is a normal active site with a glycine in there. If glycine phosphate, <clears throat> the toxic uh, herbicide, gets in there, it will be bulky and help prevent the substrate from binding into the enzyme active site pocket. In addition, its negative charge on the phosphate might repel the substrate. Okay, so that's a problem. And that's what I meant by a Trojan horse. It's coming in and it's replacing the glycine and it's messing up the function of that enzyme. Okay, and that's highly relevant because, guess what? Collagen for like the ligaments of your spine all over the place in your spine, the most common protein in the body, about, you know, about one-third of all the protein in your entire body is, is this collagen stuff. Every third amino acid on uh, collagen is glycine. For example, I drew it here as yellow. So if you're substituting in this glyphosate herbicide toxin into your collagen, you're going to mess up all your ligaments. And I think this is part of what is causing back pain. So this is one of the advantages of eating organic, to avoid this stuff. There are non-organic foods that aren't sprayed with it, so you can spend a little bit of time looking into that. Uh, but the most common you know, cheap protein used is uh, the soy. Uh, the most common cheap sweetener used is the corn, you know, high fructose corn syrup and whatnot. But this goes to show what can mess up the collagen in your spine. F- minus can do it as well. I'll talk about that in a moment. Lack of vitamin C with scurvy. Um, so... Anyways, you know, there's a few other things can do it, but those are those that that's sort of the big one. So these are reasons why a person can have pain. This is a pretty good book about F minus. This guy's a biochemist, John Yeo Muyianis. It's hard to pronounce his name. Okay, here's F minus. It's a free radical. It has an unpaired electron in its outer orbital, 
And so you see it's got seven electrons and it really wants eight. That's called completing its octet. It has an incomplete octet. And so it has an intense desire to grab another electron. And you know, one definition of pathogen is molecules that steal electrons. They steal electrons and they don't give them back. And so F minus is definitely a major pathogen. The reason why this, this vertical uh, uh, column here of uh, halogens, they're all toxic. They're all used to sterilize stuff because they, they destroy life, all right? You sanitize a pool with chlorine, okay? You can also sanitize a pool with bromine. You know, surgical prep used to primarily be iodine, okay? F minus is put in water to sterilize it, okay? So out of all the elements in the entire periodic table, the one that has the most powerful, the highest electronegativity is uh, fluorine, all right? So here it is, 3.98, and that's more than oxygen. We usually think of oxygen as having incredible high electronegativity. That's why it's the ultimate electron acceptor um, in the mitochondria for the electron transport chain, but fluoride even more so is hyperreactive, wanting to go around stealing electrons, okay? It's a major pathogen. It's used for, you know, rat poison, okay? And it also inhibits mitochondrial electron transport at the level of complex four, so it's a mitochondrial toxin. It should not be in the water. That's a big mistake. But, you know, I had the experience recently. I go to the grocery store, and I'm like, holy crap, 99% of the toothpaste on display had F-. minus. So what that means to me, I mean, I've known that F- minus was a toxin going back to the 1980s, okay? And what I'm saying is the average person still doesn't know this. These companies brag about having this in their, their their toothpaste. And I'm like, how stupid are these people? That would be like posting on your toothpaste rat poison, okay? <laughs> it's a terrible thing. You should not be ingesting that at all. You want to avoid it as much as you can, okay? You know, the aluminum companies had a waste product, and they had to get rid of it, and they did some bogus research to get it into the water supply many years ago. But it is toxic. And then they also put aluminum into the water supply, and they can form complexes with F- minus to increase traversal of the blood-brain barrier and lower IQ. This makes people stupider, okay? And this is well known. There's a whole bunch of studies on that. So what I'm saying is you don't want that in your toothpaste. You don't want that in your water. But the average person doesn't know that. Okay, and then when you try to look up papers on it, the information's kind of hidden. You know, you run into a paywall. You can't get um, the paper. <clears throat> like whenever something's published makes a commercial product look well, they make that paper available. Whereas in something they don't want you to know, you run into this where at least I got an abstract. A lot of times you can't even get an abstract on something they don't want you to know. All right, F minus disrupts collagen. Okay, that's kind of a big deal. Okay, a marker decrease in total collagen content. All right, I show you that because people are routinely ingesting this stuff, um, sometimes in their processed food drinks, routinely in their, in their municipal tap water. Uh, it's bad. Okay, um, prevents hydroxylation of proline, um, and poor collagen will increase the likelihood you have problems with your spine, increased arthritis, okay, there's such a condition of the spine called fluorosis, like I said, uh, AL and F- minus can form complexes together, you know, some kids that died at the dental office from swallowing a little bit of it, and the powerful F- minus can actually uh, replace hydrogen in some of these molecules here, it'll bind to the hydrogen. And what happens is, let's say you have a protein here, and this part of the protein is bound to this part of the protein to hold it together into the proper shape to make it functional. F- minus can substitute itself in there and damage the protein. And not only does it damage the protein, but because it's distorted the shape of the protein, if that's in a, a location accessible to the immune system, like the extracellular matrix, that protein might now be recognized as what is called a DAMPS or a PAMPS. So, PAMPS means pathogen associated molecular patterns because what the immune cells do is they recognize abnormal molecules that indicate a pathogen. So those are called PAMPS, pathogen associated molecular patterns. There's also something called a DAMPS. Just imagine a D here and that's damage associated molecular patterns. They also recognize something as damaged debris from an injury to a cell or whatnot and then they remove that from the body. But what I'm saying is you don't want these reactions going on all over the place for no reason and F- minus increases the likelihood of that happening. And like I said, it's 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 can be damaging to your collagen and give you problems with your spine. So skeletal fluorosis, okay? And here's some examples of it. Notice it can also cause these vertebral body bridging osteophytes of DISH. It basically looks like DISH. And if this patient had this x-ray in the hospital, that would be called DISH. Nobody would even mention F-. So it's a contributor to DISH, and we don't even know how 
much of the dish is caused by the F minus versus how much is caused by all the other stuff that causes dish, you know, like from ischemic disc failure. Okay, um, let's see. It increases the incidence of uh, uh, like a secondary um, hyperparathyroidism. It can cause an osteoporosis. This guy wrote a really good book. He's a dentist, uh, Dean Murphy, and he wrote a great book about uh, F minus toxicity. It's actually the best book on F minus toxicity. I've read like about four or five books on F minus toxicity. This is the best one by him. Okay, and he's just talking about how it, it causes some osteoporosis. It increases the incidence of bone fracture. It's bad for your spine. And I think that's funny that it causes dish because I see dish. I expect to see dish. The vast majority of patients I see over 50 years of age have dish. Okay, that's how common it is. Um, from a variety of exposures, um, secondary hyperparathyroidism. Okay, so this is just another article about uh, skeletal fluorosis. All right. And it's toxic to so many things. Um, and the reason I'm going through all this is because some people have a lot of back pain and they want to get better. So this is one more thing you can do. You can avoid GP by avoiding processed food, okay, and non-organic food. You can avoid F- minus by getting a reverse osmosis filter. And they also have some more specific uh, F- minus filters. You can distill water. That's a pain in the butt to do. The newer thing is ion exchange. I don't know if that can remove F- or not. I would have to look that up. Um, here's, you know, again, the pattern of skeletal fluorosis is basically being looking exactly the same as DISH. And again, in a hospital, this would just be called DISH. No one would even think of or mention F-. The only doctor I know who even knows about this is myself and the doctors I've taught this to, okay? But it's been known. It's papers from 1937, okay? And so here they're just showing more examples of F- minus also causing all the same stuff, um, OPLL, um, and then all the bridging osteophytes. It messes up the teeth. That's dental fluorosis. Um, and then we talked about how aluminum forms complexes. AL forms complexes with F-, enabling it to more readily cross the gut uh, wall and the blood-brain barrier. <laughs> Great. So that's going to interfere with neuronal function in your brain. Um, you know, like I said, there's a reason why it's used as rat poison, okay? It has synergistic toxicity with AL, and um, it's especially toxic to the hippocampus, the memory center. Great. Um, it also increases the amount of neurotoxic other types of ions that get into the brain. And this guy's book here, uh, Murphy the Dentist, uh, has the references for it, How? Uh, and that's the pages it's on, page 183, 183 to 5 of his book. Um Okay, uh, F minus mechanism of toxicity. We're not going to go into that. All you got to know for our purposes is it causes a problem like dish in the spine, and um, it can increase autoimmune inflammation in general. Okay, so that's all my slides. And the point I wanted to make was ischemia is the main thing, making the spine get worse, causing degenerative disc disease at all levels. And I routinely see it progressing all the way from the bottom of the spine, the sacrum, all the way up to the skull. The entire spine gets these problems. So if you want to minimize your likelihood of having back pain or progressive worsening spine disease leading to cord compression and all that, uh, you want to optimize blood flow to the spine. And then you want to avoid F- minus and GP as secondary thoughts. But the big thing is improving that blood flow. And exercise and all the stuff I talked about in the lecture is what does that. So anyways, I hope this was helpful to you.